Um, I've titled my segment, Get in the Game, and Sheila just mentioned the A game, which most of you know. I think the provost gave a free copy of this book to all incoming freshmen this year. And I really like the book because it's written in a nice user-friendly format. Sheila showed it to you, it's a thin little paperback. And um, the suggestions are built on what we know about learning and, uh, and have some sound science behind them, a lot of them coming from psychology, which is my discipline. I look at these rules, however, the rules for academic success, and what I see, I think, is sort of a roadmap in terms of what we should be doing in our classes. If these are the behaviors we want our students to be engaged in, then we should be constructing courses that produce those behaviors and then maintain them over the course of the semester. So, Looking at this from the instructor side, Sheila said, you know, if we want them to come to class, coming to class has to add value. We have to be doing something than, than they're just getting if they read the textbook. Sitting front and center, moving around the room, right? The sweet spot's really small in the classroom, but if we move around, we could make that sweet spot a lot larger. If we want them to come to class prepared, we have to incentivize being prepared, in my opinion. If we want them to ask questions when they're lost, we have to help make it conspicuous to them when they're lost. Because we know in teaching, a big problem is students are overconfident about their learning. They think they know something. So we have to find ways, I think, to reveal to them the lack of um, learning in certain cases. Space out the learning, that means we should be building distributed learning into our courses. If we want them to have learning objectives, we're probably going to have to teach them how to do that. And in terms of if we want them to learn at all levels, I think we need to teach at all levels. I think we need to test at all levels. And we need to be cognizant of those things. And finally, if self-testing is helpful, let's build it into our courses. So for me, I think that book actually fought, provides not just recommendations for students, for, but for us as instructors. What could we be doing to build the best type of course? Sheila and Phil and Andy have already given you a ton of ideas. They're already in the game, as it were. Um, I'm trying to get more people in the game. I'll show you what I try to do to achieve those goals, and again, without being terribly redundant, I'll talk a little bit about my interactive lecture style. I use PowerPoints, I use clickers, I use some aspects of the Angel course space. Um, I'm actually not that high tech. I think I was set up to sound like a much more of a high tech guru than I, than I am. I'm only interested in technology to the degree that it's going to help me achieve my learning goal. So I use a lot of low tech as well. Currently, I'm flipping about 50% of the courses in my two courses, which are upper division psych courses um, and fairly large enrollment courses, 150 students. And I've adopted throughout all of my courses a fairly rapid exam schedule in which students are taking exams every about two weeks, maybe two and a half weeks, depending on where we are. And again, the intention here is to in, enforce that distributed learning um, and deter that procrastination. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about what I do and then I'll show it to you, hopefully. So what I call the interactive lecture style is again, this idea of moving around the room. I like to move in front, but quite honestly, if the class allows, get out amongst the people, right? Be walking up those aisles. There's no place safe in my class because if you think you're sitting in the back and I won't call on you, good luck to you because I will very likely call on you and when I call on you, I will ask what your name is so then I can try to file that away and I can call on you by name next time. So move around the room. Sheila said use pictures. I like to create lots of visuals and diagrams and concept maps. The idea should be that I if I'm going to present material, I should be finding novel ways of presenting that material that helps, I think, create an organization that helps them map it cognitively better. I'm trying my very best to move increasingly towards more of a uh, lecture style in which students have to provide most of the information. So very stripped down PowerPoints where they're then um, we're, they're fielding questions and as they answer those questions, we're building that uh, PowerPoint outward. And then, so I guess I am the counterpoint to Andy because I use uh, clickers very heavily in my courses. Uh, I've been doing so for about eight years. I think they've fundamentally changed the way that I teach. What I like about them is the following. I think it is a very effective way to facilitate active learning and get them out of that kind of, I'm gonna sit passively and take some notes um, mindset. I love that it allows me to assess learning on the spot. I can ask them a question, I get immediate feedback as to whether they're understanding it and we can move forward, or whether there's a deficit here, great confusion, we need to stop, we need to um, go back over that material. I also love too, I mean, Sheila's talking about being excited. There's a lot of enthusiasm that clickers can create. It's reinforcing to get a question correct. It helps build their confidence. If we, if we want them to be lifelong learners, we have to build their confidence about their learning ability. Um, and then finally, you can use 
it for sort of non-instructional purposes in the sense that anonymous settings allow you to get some very um, insightful feedback from your students about what they're doing. So how many time, or when did they start studying for the exam? How many hours did they study? How difficult did they think the exam was? Those types of things. So I use it for those purposes. All right. How often what? In a classroom. Oh, uh, clicker. Um, I, I probably average about 10 clicker questions in a 75 minute course. Here, I'll show you an example. Brittany, that's an excellent question. All right, so let's say um, I teach a learning class and one of the topics in the learning class are the operant contingencies, which they're, they're sneaky because on the surface they seem really straightforward and students are like, oh yeah, I got this, no problem. <laughs> well, the positive contingencies, so there's, there's four, positive and negative reinforcement and punishment. The positive, they actually are pretty straightforward and students do fairly well, but the negative ones, they always throw students. So I know this, because I've taught this class a long time, so maybe I start here. Maybe I start by setting them up next to one another. The definitions are really similar. Here visually I've highlighted the slight differences, and then Beyond that, I've given them a concrete example of each type of contingency, tried to anchor it onto something that's relevant to them and that they can refer to later. So yeah, that's all good. I mean, that's a nice starting point, I think. But let's kick it up a notch, shall we? Let's say, okay, now I'm gonna give you a diagram. And I'm gonna say, so you know you have the four operant contingencies because you've done the reading, as I've asked, of course. <laughs> so we, ha we have those, and we're now going to talk as a class about where those contingencies go in each of those cells, one for each cell, figure out where they go. And maybe we break out and have them talk about it amongst themselves and then, and then we start to build. So we build outward, so sorry, it'll be hard to see, but we build that. And then I say, okay, great, so now you have a slightly different way of organizing that information and you can maybe use this as a reference. But what if I gave you an example of a contingency and I said, figure out which contingency it is? How would you use this diagram? What is the first question, literally, you have to ask yourself? And so we can now have some discussion about that. And they, they have to offer up that information. And eventually, we would get to the idea that the first question you have to answer is, what's the behavior? What am I even talking about? Then I say, OK, great, we've got the behavior. Now, in terms of using that diagram, where do you need to start? Are you going to start with your columns, or are you going to start with your rows? Go back and look at your definitions. What do you need to know first? Because if you do it in the wrong order, you're gonna get the wrong answer. So we get them now thinking, okay, logically, which of these, which bits of information do I need to know first? So this is the idea of sort of slowly building this PowerPoint, but they, they are providing the information, and then we, we build it outward like that. Then I say, okay, great, so now we've got this, but I say, okay, now let's do a question. All right, so I've made up a, and I make up some really ridiculous scenarios. I had one yesterday about a party pony named Sparkler who wore a sombrero. Um, but so how, here we have, you know, a kind of an applied question. It's not too tricky, but it's a little tricky um, about walking across uh, campus and it starts to rain and you pull out your umbrella and um, that eliminates getting wet and the next morning it's raining and you quickly open your umbrella. All right, tell me what type of contingency is in effect. So if I were doing this in class, I might say, all right, we're gonna do this as a clicker question, and at first I want you to answer it independently. And you got your notes in front of you, and so look at your notes, you got, you got 30 seconds, answer. And you would all have one of these snazzy little deals, clicker, these are clicker options. Um, and you would use that to answer A, B, C, or D. And then let's say I actually had you do that, and then up pop this um, distribution of responses. And immediately this tells me oh, we got, we got big problems here, okay? Because there's no clear winner and the, there's wide you know, variability in the answers. So I say, all right, we're gonna re-poll in a minute. Now I want you to talk to your neighbor, okay? And I want you to argue your position, let them argue there. If you're on different positions, see um, if you change your position based on that feedback, and if so, we'll re-poll and we'll see where we are. And we might do a couple of cycles of that depending on how varied it is. Um, but the idea would be is that we're giving them lots of practice and we're asking them to start working through how to apply these contingencies. Now, that's a decent question, but I agree with Andy. It's not a great question. It's kind of a low level multiple choice question. What if I did something like this? Oh, even better. It's the exact same scenario, but now, because I'm thinking, I have planted among my distractors the common mistakes that I know students will make. 
So I'm intentionally, in this sense, kind of setting them up to get this question wrong. But I agree with, I think it was Phil who said it, I want them to make the mistakes here. Let's make them in the classroom. There's no downside to that. Let's not wait and make them on the exam. So we'll make them here, and I've deliberately planted um, some ways of drawing them off, because I know sometimes they can arrive at the right answer, but for the wrong reason. And ultimately, that's going to trip them up. So this is a better, um, a better type of clicker question. And again, it allows me an opportunity to really point to the things that I know will um, trip students up and to make that conspicuous to them, too. All right, so there's examples of clicker questions. OK, so you might be sitting there saying, well, yeah, I mean, 10 clicker questions in a class, that takes up a lot of time, Swindell. It does. <laughs> Admittedly, it does. Um, and as we've seen, that's why we're running late today, because we're all trying to be interactive. Um, but it's so important, and I'm willing to do that. And I, what I've tried to do is um, then solve that problem by moving the lecture out of the class time entirely. Why am I spending class time lecturing when they could be accessing that material outside of class? Now, sure, they could be reading, but we've discussed the challenges with getting them to read. So in my class, I do this. I've taken my PowerPoint um, lectures, and I've just audio narrated them, and I stick them in Angel. They're posted. The students can go in, access um, the audio. They, I instruct them to treat them just as if they were listening to me in class, take notes. Um, and they do that all in preparation for coming to class. And many times there's some assigned reading as well. The last flip um, activity I did in my methods course, they had to read the introduction and uh, methods of a research paper. And we use that as part of the flip activity. Then they come to class. In class, right, I'm going to incentivize preparation. I'm going to give them a clicker quiz when they arrive. It's low grade questions. I'm really just checking to see if they've done what I wanted them to do. I don't expect them to have completely mastered the material at this point. But we incentivize um, that, so they do those individually. Then we break them into groups of ideally three to six. This is a class of 150 students. So we break them into groups of three to six. We give them a structured learning activity. What, by that I mean, it's basically a three-page activity. It starts with kind of low-level questions, and it builds conceptually to more complicated um, questions with hopefully higher levels of learning, right? Teach and test um, at multiple levels. Embedded in that activity are stop points. So we'll have them work for, Sheila said, 10 minutes, right? Because that's the attention span, 10 minutes. Then we're going to come back as a group. We're going to discuss what they got. Then they're going to break back out again. So there's kind of these report, um, report back to me, break back out. Um, Andy mentioned using undergraduate TAs. I've got five TAs who took this class last spring. They were terrific. I recruited them. They're working in my class as facilitators. So as the students are working, those uh, five individuals and myself are walking around the room. We're asking them questions. We're looking to see if they're completely off in the wrong direction, and we're trying to redirect. And then we, if we have time, ideally, we do a post-activity clicker um, set of questions. And it's their opportunity to self-test them. What did you learn today? Did you, are, are you, do you understand the material better than when you came in? OK, so just to demonstrate that really quickly, I just showed you a diagram that we might build in class if it were a, a non-flip day. On a flip day, what if they come in and the structured activity begins with a diagram, and then I give them all of these phrases or words in an envelope, and I say, build the diagram. Okay, and I'm going give to give them those three questions, and I'm going to say, I want you to think about what would be the order that you'd need to ask those questions in. So they could work on that for. 10, 15 minutes, then they would report back out. And as a class, then we would build it on the PowerPoint together. And we'd see where the points of confusion are. Then the learning um, exercise could build towards these application questions, again, sort of low level. Then we could get even more complicated. So this scenario involves a situation um, in dealing with uh, smoking behavior. So smoking behavior has both operant contingency arrangements. So I can use it as an opportunity to talk about the contingencies, but I can also add in antecedents, another part of conditioning. Oh, but cooler yet, this example involves aspects of conditioning that we talked about in the first two weeks of class. Back old respondent conditioning. Let's bring that back. Let's help them tie that information together. So now you're, you're creating this, um, uh, letting them synthesize that information, right? Higher levels of learning. Oh, but let's not stop there. Let's culminate that learning activity with an adorable story about an interaction between a five-year-old little girl and her father. So 
in this situation, we now have two participants. We can analyze that interaction from Sabrina's perspective, the five-year-old, and talk about her behavior. We can also talk about dad's behavior. That includes both elements of operant con um, conditioning and the contingencies. Oh, but even more fun, after we've done all that analysis, now let's critique dad. How has he done? The way that he's resolved this situation, which I'm not going to read, um, did he, was it a smart parenting strategy? From a conditioning perspective, is he going to minimize Sabrina's temper tantrums in the future? Or did he make a gross misstep? And in fact, her temper tantrums are going to get even worse. And so now they're kind of evaluating. Again, hopefully getting to those deeper levels of learning. Um, so that was like record fast. That's what I've got, <laughs> Rebecca. Um, but I guess I hope people got a lot of great suggestions today about how you can get in the game. Um, and you don't have to do all of this stuff immediately, but you could pick just a few of those rules and think about how you could restructure your course or structure your course in a way to encourage them. And those would be my recommendations. Thank you.